our next uh, storyteller, another regular, um, without further ado, Chitty. Second one is this sort of irrepressible urge for immediate an immediate change in circumstances. So that's what makes a revolution. The thing is, and I should say this to people, having these two ingredients doesn't always guarantee success. It means there will be a revolution, but it doesn't mean a revolution will work. So, so that's what you should understand. Now, in this whole thing of uh, revolution, revolutions, you also have different types of revolutions. Uh, you can have, shall we say, political revolutions where suddenly, out of the blue, you have a leader. And everyone is saying, how did that happen? Where did this guy come from? And you all know it's because of conditions and the fact that there was a need for change. Or you could have, um, shall we say, artistic revolutions where you have an artist or a painter who used to paint like this and suddenly paints that way. And having changed the style of painting, all the critics get mad and say, this is sacrilege, this is not art, this is this, this is that. And then the artist will say something like, well, if I want people to have three eyes in my paintings and blue faces and seven ears, then let that be the case. I'm a visionary, I'm a revolutionary, and so on. Uh, you also have dietary revolutions. That's actually quite an interesting one, where you find that you, you end up eating lots and lots and lots of product A, B, and C, because a certain expert has told you eating A, B, and C will increase your intellect, then six months later, you abandon A, B, and C and go on to GHI because someone else has told you that will make you better. Then six months later, you have something else and on and on and on. And actually, dietary revolutions are probably the worst. They're, they're very violent. And I know this because um, Che Guevara, you know him, the guy with the beret and the star, uh, on a particular Wednesday afternoon, apparently he was asked, what are we eating next week? And he began to shiver and shake. He said, don't ask me about those things. Ask me about asymmetrical warfare. Ask me about political uh, uh, ideology. But please don't ask me about diet. So you understand that revolutions come in all shapes and sizes. And they can be all kinds of crazy things. Now, that aside, when I was 14, my family, or myself and my brother and sisters, we found ourselves in conditions that could lead to a revolution. <laughs> What had happened is my parents had moved us from Oxford, England, to a place called Nsukka, Nigeria. And it should have been fun, because you have new scenery, you have new people, you have new temperature, you have new colors. It's really exciting, except for the fact that my parents lost their minds. <laughs> I they're not like that, I love them very much, but honestly, they lost their minds. And somewhere in between that journey between from Oxford to Nsukka, something changed. And what changed was about 53% of all the things we used to do in England, what were allowed, were suddenly not allowed. So we could no longer use our left hand to give things to people, which made no sense to us. But that was our culture. You couldn't give things with your left hand. You gave things and received things with the right. There were a whole bunch of things that went on and on and on. You had to do this, you had to do that. And we didn't like it. If I told you everything, I'd be here for about a month moaning and complaining, so I'll just stick to two things that really stuck it to us. And these two things were prayer and chickens. Now, they were not together, they're separate, but they, they, got, us, they got us going. Prayer was very, uh, a very odd one. When we were small, we went to church. My parents were quite Christian, so we had to go to church, and by the time we reached about seven or eight, somehow we found a way of not going to church anymore. This was me, so we didn't have to go to church. However, in Nigeria, it was really difficult for people to believe you did not believe. That just wasn't possible. You, you had a situation where the peer pressure really crushed down on your parents, and you had to go to church. So what my dad decided, for some strange reason, was to get us into the group. He would wake us up at 5.30 to start praying. 5.30 in the morning, not even 5.30 in the morning, we'd have to get up and start praying, and we hated this. First of all, for me, I, I mean, 
I have no issues with people who believe, but I just didn't believe. The good thing about prayer is that you can pretend to pray. You can close your eyes, and if you time it well, you don't snore. You just kind of stay there, <laughs> motion, and there you go. So that, you know, we, we figured this out. Uh, my sisters and my brothers worked out a scheme that allowed us to pretend to pray, and that satisfied my parents. The chicken part, that, that was really rough, because the, one day he just, in the garage, there were these boxes like this, and they were full of tiny little chicks. And we sort of looked around, and he said, yes, these are for you. And the reason they were for us, apparently, people felt, those children, those ones who came back from England, they're really lazy. Now, when we were in England, we could hardly play, because my dad was obsessed with us reading and reading and learning and reading, so we learned to read. We read all day long, we read all night, but we didn't do many physical things. We just loved reading. And suddenly we have these chickens. And these chickens are there, and we have to look after them. Yeah, I'm not We had to look after the chickens. We had to sort of feed them. You had to do this, you know. You had to have eggs. And uh, we ha had to kill them as well, which it, I, yeah, that's such is the life of a chicken. But <laughs> we didn't like it, because you also had to get up really early, and you had to do a lot of stuff. I don't know if anyone's ever looked after the chickens. If you look after one, it's bad. There's a whole bunch of chickens rows of chickens, we had to look after them. And we hated it, we hated it. And so we began to plot and plan, because on the one hand you've got this 5, 5.30 prayer, and then after that we had to go to do the chickens, and we just didn't like it. There was a slight problem though, that our rebellion, there were some little technical issues. For example, our pocket money came from the enemy. <laughs> our food came from the enemy, our beds came from the enemy, the clothes on our backs came from the enemy, the house belonged to the enemy, so you have this tiny little window, <laughs> rebellion just in there, that's what you can do. So you have to work out your plans, you have to be really careful about what you do. So we began to scheme and plot, how can we break free of this, uh, this, this, this uh, horror? And we'd come up with one plan after another, we'd kill the chickens, no, because we'd get into trouble. And how do you explain the sort of slaughterhouse <laughs> and get away with that? Then we started thinking, okay, we be, one, one after the other, we got illnesses. Every morning, one would have some form of malaria that didn't have a temperature with it until my mother cottoned on, and that was the end of that. So we're still there. About a month later, we're doing this, getting up, and chickens, praying, chickens, praying. It's horrible. And finally, something happened, and my older sister came up with this idea. If you have chickens and you kill them, you usually sharpen the knife and it makes a sort of this. Yes, it, it's a chicken side, sorry. You sharpen the thing, but whenever you sharpen it, all the chickens would start screaming. You can go, oh, 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 making all this noise. So we figured, hey, you could actually train a chicken to be afraid of something. And so the plan was to train the chicken afraid of my dad, so that they would attack him, and he wouldn't have the chickens anymore. <laughs> Genius idea. We're young, remember? We're, we're very, very, you know, we've, 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 got, we've got plans. So we started thinking, how do you make chickens angry? And it's not actually easy. Chickens are really, so we'd sort of throw things at them, and they're just like, yeah, right. <laughs> Nothing would happen. And we try everything, and eventually we found what really chickens don't like, they don't like red pepper. <laughs> yeah? It did, doesn't make them angry, but they don't like it. So we think that if you threw enough red pepper, if you threw enough red pepper into the chickens, and then, uh, my voice is now deep, but then it was a rather high voice, my dad's voice was deep, so we sort of threw the pepper in, I'd say, rrr, rrr, rrr. and the chickens would think, oh, that, that guy with the deep voice, so then when my dad would go to check the chickens, the chickens would attack him, and we'd be free of this horror. So that was the plan. Now the plan, in order to do this, you couldn't do it during the day, because um, we had a houseboy and he was a bit of a rat. He was a nice guy, but he would rat on us. I don't know why, but he would always tell my parents what we had done for something good. So you couldn't do anything during the day. So it had to be at night. And it couldn't be just at the beginning of night because my parents were awake. So you had to do it later on, late, much later on at night. And so we worked out that around one o'clock was a safe time to grab this sort of jar of, of ground pepper, kind of pepper, throw it over to the chickens while I'd be going, rrr, 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 rrr. and then the chickens would think, oh, that's that guy, and so in the morning they'd attack my dad. Now, as with all plans, 
We all know this thing. It was a good idea at the time. It was a brilliant idea. <laughs> so we get ready, and in the middle of the night, I get up, get out of my bed, take my brother, who he's really small, he'd do anything I said, he had no choice. I go to my sister's room, I said, hey, are you ready? Because we're gonna do it. And they said, yes, we're coming. Key word, yes, we're coming. So I ran out with my partner, and I sort of felt a strange, I don't know, silence, you could call it, a strange silence. And something came to mind, this cartoon that I'd seen from time to time, I don't know if anyone's, anyone else has seen it, but you see a guy running, and the guy running has a face as if he's backed by thousands. He's running to the enemy. But you, the observer, you see that this man is alone. And it's all very funny. You know, it's a little cartoon in Mad Comics, and there are all these variations of this cartoon. And suddenly, I felt that way, but it was too late. Because I'm already on the move, and I'm getting ready to throw the stuff to the chickens. I'm even in James Bond mode, or even higher than James Bond mode. Because <laughs> I can imagine myself sort of the kind of person that James Bond, if they're in a cinema, would be watching. So as we watch James Bond, James Bond would be watching them. And I was that person, sleeping around, <laughs> absolute darkness for this stuff. And I was getting ready to do things. And then we have to pause. Because I have to explain something about my dad. And I think a lot of dads do this. I'm convinced parents uh, take courses in how to tamper with their children's brains. <laughs> and one of the things my dad did, there are two things actually. One was he was really smart, so that terrified me. The other one was that he could move without making any noise. <laughs> <laughs> really, he just, you'd be sort of somewhere, you'd hear the typewriter upstairs, and he's like, dur, 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 dur. and then you'd go do something, and suddenly he'd be there. <laughs> you'd have chocolate in your hand, you wouldn't know what to, accept, what to say. <laughs> and so, the same thing happened. I threw the pepper over, it didn't even get over, so I threw it, and then suddenly, ah! my dad's there. I couldn't say anything, I just started talking nonsense. I started talking about Apollo 11, I started talking about jet engines, about jet engines. <laughs> just all kinds of nonsense. And then he, he did this thing that parents can do, which is worse than anything. They don't get angry, they don't shout. He just fixed them with a look, have you nothing better to do? <laughs> and once you're hit with one of those things, once you're hit with a question like that, you avoid your parents for about a month because of the shame. You just feel really stupid. <laughs> so that's what happened. And basically, the point I'm trying to make is actually not even about revolution at all. It's not about that. It's about if you're dealing with people, if you're in a group thing, if you're dealing with people, and you say to someone, are you coming? And they say, yes, I'm coming. I suggest you wait. <laughs> then you know you have a team. And under those circumstances, revolutions will succeed. Without that, they fail. <laughs>